So I'm going to continue on the theme with Lorelei. We are a good team with the uh, Nomenclature Committee for Fungi. <clears throat> now, last year at this time, I presented this slide with fewer words, Amsterdam to 2011, one fungus equals one name. Since then, repercussions of the Amsterdam Declaration on Fungal Nomenclature resulted in this cascading effect with the uh, Botanical Congress, so which we have the new name, and now we're back to uh, Amsterdam with uh, one fungus equals which name. <clears throat> now, as pointed out by David Hawksworth and Lorelei, um, that at the Botanical Congress, there was a handful of mycologists had a major effect uh, amongst the sea of botanists and one mycologist. <clears throat> and also, as pointed out by David Hawksworth, but I should emphasize this because there has been some confusion. I've had questions come in <clears throat> as to when the effective dates are. The effective date for the changes uh, was July 30th, 2011. <clears throat> and basically, that's when dual nomenclature ended. <clears throat> we built into it a buffer because we knew the news would take a while to spread. So we weren't going to penalize people for continuing dual nomenclature for this, well, for a year and a half after that date. <clears throat> so the names published, at the, which were in press, are not going to become illegitimate or invalid depending on the circumstances. But we've given fair warning that come uh, 2013, this won't be tolerated anymore. And so that if you actually publish an avowed alternate name for a species, it won't just be illegitimate. If you publish it simultaneously, they'll be invalid. They won't be recognized. We won't register them. <clears throat> if you publish an avowed second name, alternative name for something that already has a name and it's available yeah, and it's legitimate, then your name will be, second name will be illegitimate. So there's a couple of, of caveats there. But I just wanted to emphasize that the thing is in effect now and there was a, there's a grace period. That's what... <clears throat> so... I've also had questions addressed to me as to, well, what happens now if some committee or subcommittee decides that we're going to restrict the usage of something like the genus Candida? <clears throat> can, can we continue to publish in this, especially if we don't know where, where the species goes? And yes, you can continue to publish using these generic names. If, if the issues haven't been resolved, there's nothing to stop you from continuing to publish a new species using an old concept, and it can be sorted out later. There's nothing to prevent you from doing this. And so one shouldn't worry about that unduly. Um, now, to buffer the followed effects of, of basic rewriting removal of, of the premise for Article 59, uh, we threw in two more articles in Article 14 and 56, which is to create these lists. And one is a list of names that, um, where you're con basically conserving it against something else. And the second list is, we just want to get rid of these names, and it's a list of, of names to be rejected. And, and also, it was purposely worded in such a way that it, it didn't restrict it. It's not restricted as to the Basidia mycota or the Ask mycota, like Article 59 used to cover. It opened the door here to basically, we, can, we as mycologists can approve whatever we want and make it so. And this be very useful. Um, unfortunately, I suppose, the, the lichenized fungi were excluded, but I believe David Hawksworth may be making some progress towards changing that situation. And again, it was a misunderstding, but it is amazing what happens at one of these congresses where people get quite excited about things. <clears throat> so, um, this is a draft that I believe might have been supplied by David Hawksworth. The, the, the final wording is the final wording when, it comes, when the code comes out. But. This was the basis of creating these lists. Um, so Article 14, 13, and I've outlined in red these different committees. So the list of names may be submitted to the general committee, which will refer them to the nomenclatural committee for fungi for examination by subcommittees established by that committee uh, in consultation with the general committee and appropriate international bodies. <coughs> so, you know, what's meant by appropriate international bodies. Well, there's a, there's a list of things that could be there. Now, some of them are, are commissions, some are subcommissions. But the, the point I wanted to emphasize here is that subcommittees of the Nomenclatural Committee for Fungi are not necessarily equal to commissions or subcommissions. <clears throat> but I think quite logically, they may end up having the same membership. This is where we have to work together cooperatively. <clears throat> but technically, there's a slight difference there. So the Nomenclatural Committee for Fungi, of which Laura is the secretary, <coughs> is established by the International Association of Plant Taxonomists, 
Uh, you may see an irony here. <laughs> and the members are elected by the International Botanical Congress <laughs> every six years and reports to the General Committee. And then the International Code of Nomenclature for Algae, Fungi, and Plants, as currently governed, <laughs> uh, can only be modified at these International Botanical Congresses. Seems kind of odd now that uh, my, my colleagues have more of an influence that the only decisions are going to be made at the Botanical Congress. So. There, were, there is a, sub, a special committee being set up by the Botanical Congress, which will look at governance. And again, some of the proposals David Hawksworth published are being examined there as to who governs the codes that pertains to these different groups. <clears throat> Anyhow, there are two different bodies. So then we have the International Commission on Taxonomy of the Fungi, of which Keith is the chair. And we have Andy Miller here as the secretary, I believe. And it, um, I can be corrected if I'm wrong, but it reports it's a commission of the Mycological Division of the uh, International Union of Microbiological Sciences and also of the International Mycological Association. There are two different bodies. So in forming these, these groups, and we're all interested in, in having the mycologists that have expertise in certain groups work on those groups and tell us what they are, because we certainly don't want to be overloaded in the Committee for Fungi with making all, all these decisions. We don't actually have a timer at the inclination or want to do that. We want each of you to come together, tell us what you want, and we'll set some certain guidelines for you. <clears throat> now, the, this is extracting from an email exchange with uh, uh, John McNeil, who was the Rapporteur General for the Co uh, Botanical Congress there. Uh, and this refers to one of the groups that have been talked about here, the Trichoma, you see. And previously, when there were names in common use, there was this list developed. Um, and it was, it's been debated as to what the status of this list was. And you know, John has pointed out that it's never been part of the code. So when a new code comes out, it supersedes the other codes. This has never been part of the code. But the interesting thing is the Tokyo Congress recommended that there was the uh, suspension of the application of the code where, uh, where necessary. It's very interesting that you just step outside the code. <clears throat> um, he also, and I didn't quote him here, went on to say that my colleagues have the opportunity to formalize this now. And indeed we do, um, so that it can be part of the code. And I hope everyone views this as an, an opportunity rather than a hindrance. Um, so, okay, so people are, have been concerned. You know, they, they feel that uh, people are going to be autocratic and dictatorial. Um, really don't want that. We don't have the time. I don't have the time. So who's can, who can submit the list? Well, it, it just says lists can be submitted to the General Committee. It hasn't yet been decided how these lists are to be submitted. Uh, John McNeil, when we were writing the um, instructions to authors for taxon where proposals are published, we put a vague paragraph in there because it hasn't yet been resolved how to do this. So anybody can submit them, but we expect that the majority of the lists with any substance will be formed by groups such as the International Commission of Taxonomy of Fungi or its commissions or subcommissions. Um, and how, how should the list be formed? It, you know, it's been suggested that, that we make these publicly available in some ways so that people can look at them, see them, see what's happening, uh, add uh, comments to it. It's how the process operates. Well, the chair of the committee, me, uh, has been given this role of, of, of trying to police or guide or um, the formation of these committees to ensure we have coverage, that, that there will be overlap. So somebody needs to come in and mediate um, overlapping interests, guide things along, push them along. But I certainly don't want to be making a lot of decisions. It's just a matter of nudging people together and saying, all right, this is a yeast group, but you know what? These are the alternative morphs of a bunch of basidiomyces that another group is interested in. So let's just ensure that both groups are working together when they're making decisions on things. And as, again, as David Hawksworth has mentioned, a model that we can look at is how they handled it with bacteria. And you can go online and see there's a list of approved bacterial names. Not just at the generic level or the species level, but all the groups. And again, the lists that we proposed don't, do not, are not necessarily restricted just to genera. You could put families in, you could put whatever is covered by the code. So this is a sort, again, sort of a model. Look at, uh, you see that there's an authority, there's a year, there's a publication. Uh, pagination here isn't quite as specific as the botanical code, or the old botanical code required. And there's a type. And in this case, they refer back to the old uh, last 
Berge's manual, uh, the eighth volume. Uh, as compared to what we currently have for our lists in the code, which are the, uh, we have rejected names, we have conserved names, and, and again, David Hawksworth uh, seemed to have covered all the topics. <laughs> pointed out that there was a model there uh, for, for what the sort of information is, that uh, is needed. And, and this is one of the things that I will require of the groups that are putting the list together is for them to do their homework, not just give me a list of names or give us a list of names and say, we'd like to protect these and we'd like to get rid of these with no details there. If you can't actually specify or find the publication where it was published, then I don't want it on a list. You know, either show, it's like show me the money, show me the paper. <laughs> is is it there? Because oftentimes there's mistakes. So it's good to start with a grand idea, but somebody has to do the homework and come up with a specific publication. Um, there's no sense conserving names if they're not even valid. <clears throat> so it's up to the different groups. Are you going to call it a fusarium or a gibberella? <clears throat> and then there's complex issues like the rust <clears throat> and Again, you have to look at these things, and this is from the British and Irish checklist, but I see the same species epithet there in various, uh, with different authorships, and I kind of wonder, you know, what are these? Somebody should look at these and decide whether they're just carrying through, whether they're combinations. So somebody has to do some, some homework, but again, um, if you publish a proposal in taxon, so the committee looks at it for conservation. We need to know what the type is, a neotype, lectotype, holotype, whatever. If we go this route here, we can kind of go past that. If, if, if a name has, an, uh, there was an illustration in the original protologue, you might be forced to, if you were going through a normal procedure, say, well, you'd be forced to pick one of the illustrations. But if we put together a list and you said, as a group, collectively, we want these types, and then they get approved and that's it. They're more or less conserved with those types. So that, again, there's an opportunity here to cut through a lot of stuff. And it, as Keith has pointed out, <clears throat> there are these complex issues. And this, this is a genus that uh, Ron Peterson and I published, generic name for a species that uh, already had two generic names, Telacliteopsis and Sclerostilbum. And, and then you run into the complications. Well, the type for Dendroclibia is uh, a sanctioned name with the type of a sanction name. So you get all sorts of complications there. And I think, again, we can cut through a lot of this if we, if we adopt the list. Um, and then to touch on the last topic that uh, Laurel I was talking about there um, is this registration. And again, that, that can go you know, glove in hand with the formations of these lists. I think, again, my ecology is way ahead of the game as far as uh, other groups go um, in, in botany. <clears throat> We have this opportunity to do this. Um, I pointed this out last year. I really have to wonder if, if we could become grand and say, if we register everything, we've got lists of everything, why do we need authorities for anything? You have a number and you just go do it. It would remove a lot of, on the one hand, egotistical recombining. On the other hand, it might remove the incentive to actually work on fungi. But i throw that back out there. <coughs> um, so to touch on another topic, which will segue into um, the next talk, which is on databases um, and registration, um, the Committee for Fungi, as Lorelai pointed out, has to make a decision this year. And I want it to be made by the summer uh, as to where the, uh, or which or where we can register names formally so that we can, we can put this out and we say, this is, this is where we want you to go. And, and so there's, there's various opportunities here, and I think Paul Kirk and Yost Alpers will talk about that. But I've run into some problems um, in testing some of these systems, and I'll just point this out, and then uh, Paul and Yost can talk about these. Um, Paul has um, put a, set up a, a system where you can instantly publish things um, in Index Fungorum, a very interesting minimalistic sort of way of doing things. I've tested this out, one of the few people in the world that have tested this thing out. And I've run into this problem where if I go to Microbank and register something, it tells me whether that name exists. Uh, if I go and use the Index Fungorum system, it doesn't necessarily tell me uh, it exists. And it takes a while for it to get into Microbank. 
So it would be nice to streamline, uh, I'll make a suggestion, or have mirror, these sites mirror one another a bit more efficiently. I'm gonna, I believe, I'm gonna end it there. <laughs>